Let's talk about how you can protect your books from being damaged by sunlight, humidity, and other elements. So I made a video several months ago where I gave a lot of uh, advice for collectors of manga and comics uh, for both beginners in collecting and people who've been collecting for a little while. And in that video, there was a section where I specifically talked about different like environmental damages and different damage that can happen to your books and what you can do to protect your books from those things. Now I wanted to make this video to kind of expand on that section of that larger video because uh, there's more information that I've learned over time that I want to impart upon people, but number two, because I've also become aware of some uh, kind of misconceptions and misinformation that's spread about how things like sunlight and humidity can impact your books. So in this video, I'm gonna go over uh, five different things that can cause damages to your books and what you can do to protect your books from being damaged by those things. So let's start with what's probably the most well-known element that can cause damage to your books, and that, of course, is sunlight. Sunlight is the first thing that people talk about when they're thinking about how different environmental elements can cause damage to your collection. And of course, most people automatically conflate sunlight with causing yellowing of pages. And while sunlight is a factor that can cause yellowing of your pages, it's actually not the main factor that causes that, and it's actually not the biggest issue that sunlight can cause that I get concerned about. The biggest issue caused by sunlight is actually spine fading and cover fading. Now, this is a great example that I have of a book that was an ex-library copy. This is Inuyasha Visbig Volume 6. And you can see that the spine has a very pale, very bright pink color. And that's because long-term exposure to sunlight caused it to turn this pale color. But the reason why this is such a great example is because there's these two darker spots down here, and that's where the library stickers had been placed. And when I purchased this book and I cleaned it up and pulled all of the library stickers and tape off of it, these two spots had not been affected by the direct exposure to sunlight over a long period of time. So you can literally see how heavily a book can be faded from exposure to sunlight. Now this is something that impacts not just books, spine fading, this type of fading will impact if you're a collector of books, whether it be comics, manga, or novels, it can impact other media as well. If you're a collector of movies, of music, of board games, video games, anything like that that's exposed to sunlight directly for a long period of time can have this happen. And it is the most annoying thing to me, especially because when you have a collection of series of books, and one of the volumes is faded, but it's next to a volume that's not, you can see how much lighter this volume of Prince of Tennis is compared to this one, because one of them had been exposed to light a lot longer than the other one, and it just causes it to look mismatched on your shelf. Now, there are multiple different routes you can take to try and protect your books from exposure to direct sunlight. And there are ones that are you know, more expensive and ones that are less expensive. Now, the first one would be, of course, if you have a room in your home that has zero windows, this is gonna be the perfect place for you to have a library. Most people are not fortunate enough to have a room with no windows. So for the rest of us, you're gonna wanna do one of three other things. You can get shutters, blinds, or curtains. Now, of course, I know some people just put a shelf right in front of their window so that the light just doesn't go through, and that's also an option, but let's say you don't want to cover your windows with shelves. Um, so the most expensive option of those is going to be shutters. Shutters are going to be most expensive to purchase. More often than not, you're going to have to have someone install them unless you are able to install them yourselves. They're nicer looking. Uh, they're often very good at blocking out the sun because they're made out of wood or some material that just doesn't let light pass through it at all. Um, but again, it is the most costly option of the three that I'm talking about. Now, the second option is going to be blinds. Now, blinds are great because they are pretty cost effective. You can buy cheap blinds that aren't going to be as nice looking, or you can buy more expensive blinds that will be a lot nicer looking. You can also install blinds yourself. They're not that hard to install. I've installed blinds in this home as well as in our previous home, and it's not that hard of a process. However, if you live somewhere like in an apartment or anywhere else where you don't have the option to just install something like a blinds or shutters, then both of those options go out the window for you. 
Now the third option is in my opinion, the best option, and that is to purchase 100% blackout curtains. Now these are a great option because they're cost effective, they're easy to install, and even if you live somewhere like an apartment or somewhere else where you can't install stuff like shutters or blinds, you can usually install curtains, and even if you're not allowed to put the rod on the wall, uh, you can still do something that my wife and I actually did back in our first apartment. There was too much light coming in, waking us up in the morning in our bedroom, and so I just nailed curtains against the wall. Uh, I didn't even have to buy a curtain rod or install it or anything, I just put a couple nails on the wall and we didn't get in trouble with the apartment complex at all, so everything worked out. And 100% blackout curtains is actually the option that I've gone with in my library. So let me go ahead and show you guys what we've got here. All right, so I'm a black figure in front of the windows at this point, but I'm trying to display the fact that, you know, I have the windows in my library, I have three of these window panels. And so with that, we had to buy six of these blackout curtains. Now let me show you that if I close these, That literally blocks out 100% of the light. That, it, it works perfectly. These six panels that I had to buy for the three window panels that I have in this library, uh, my wife bought them off of Wayfair and they were less than $100 for the set of six curtain panels. So they're cost effective, they're easy to install, they're easy to use, and they 100% work. As you can see there, not a bit of light came through beyond those curtains once I closed them, which is exactly what you want. Now earlier in the video, I did mention that there was misconception about sunlight being the biggest factor that causes yellowing of pages. The biggest factor that actually causes the yellowing of pages is exposure to oxygen. So what happens, and I'll explain basically a, a little bit of the science behind it. I'm not gonna go full Bill Nye on you, but um, when wood is being processed into paper, uh, the imperfections, the impurities, and different compounds are being processed out of the wood. Uh, and depending on what grade of paper, what type of paper it's being made into, uh, more of those impurities will be processed out. So higher grade paper is going to have less of those compounds present, and the higher grade paper usually will be uh, more of a stark white, it won't be as pulpy as a lower grade paper, and it will not yellow as quickly over time. It may yellow, but it's going to take a lot longer to happen as opposed to the yellowing that happens in lower grade paper, such as the newsprint type paper that's used in manga, like that, or in mass market paperback novels and stuff like that, like romance novels that you find at the grocery store or that at the local pharmacy. This low processed newsprint pulpy paper uh, contains more of a compound called lignin in it. More of that lignin is left in the paper and not processed out. And lignin is something that in the wood causes that wood to become rigid when it's exposed to the elements. If you were to cut a branch off of a tree, the wood on the tree that you're exposing, when you first see it, if it's a healthy living tree, that wood is often going to be softer, maybe a little bit moist to the touch. Um, but over time, the exposure to oxygen, the exposure to light, and the exposure to levels of humidity are going to cause that wood to actually become more rigid and oftentimes the color will change. That's lignin at work. So the paper that's found in most manga, the low quality pulpy newsprint paper has a lot more lignin in it and that lignin reacts to oxygen in the air and as it oxidizes it does take on that yellow color. So the yellowing is just something that will naturally happen over time and yes you can slow the process by making sure that you don't have your books directly exposed to light or exposed to certain levels of humidity but over time it's something that will happen. Speaking of humidity though, let's go ahead and talk about humidity because this is where there's actually another big misconception. And that's because when people think about humidity and how humidity affects your books, they usually just think about high levels of humidity causing things like wavy pages and over time possibly mold, but they don't think about the other end of the spectrum. And this can be kind of harmful because I see a lot of people making comments on videos, on my videos and elsewhere, where they're saying every person that has a collection of books and stuff needs to have a dehumidifier, 
which is not true and can actually be harmful to someone's books depending on the environment that they're in. Everyone lives in a different environment, and everyone's home is different as well. Your humidity level may be lower or higher than someone else's. And if you live somewhere that has very high levels of humidity, then yes, a dehumidifier may actually be something that you want to get, especially if you're experiencing issues with pages becoming wavy or possibly over time, that high level of humidity creating mold on your paper. However, if you live in the opposite kind of environment, it's very dry and arid, you're going to have completely different issues, and having a dehumidifier can actually hurt your books over helping them. So what happens when your books are exposed to very low levels of humidity over time? Well, the lack of moisture in the air can actually cause your pages to dry out, and that's what causes them to turn a darker, more brownish yellow, as you can see in this old volume of Prince of Tennis. These pages become more brittle over time because of the lack of moisture in the air. It's just like lack of moisture in the air causes your skin to become brittle and can become dry and crack over time the same way that the paper can become brittle and dry over time and it causes it to get that nasty brownish yellow hue. So every environment is going to be different and you really have to pay attention to what the humidity level is in your personal environment and what is best for you and for your collection. Because the humidity level is not just impacting your library, but it's impacting you as well. So the question then is what is the optimal humidity level for your books, for your library? The optimal level is 50%. You can go a little bit higher and a little bit lower, keep it between about 40 to 60, depending on what's most comfortable for you, but any higher, and that becomes a breeding ground for the bacteria that can bring in mold, and any lower, it's a breeding ground for allergens, and like I said, it can dry you out, it can dry your skin, it can crack, you can get nosebleeds and stuff, if the humidity level is too low. Now, if you don't have a thermostat in your home that can automatically read the humidity level and tell you what percentage you're at within your home, you can buy something online through Amazon for pretty cheap that will show you that humidity level. So then you can keep in mind whether you need to add moisture to the air or take moisture away by using something like a humidifier or a dehumidifier. And you can find pretty cheap humidifiers or dehumidifiers as well. And if you are someone who prefers it to be more humid in your home or less humid in your home, um, if that's more comfortable for you, you can also just get a humidifier or dehumidifier to put in your library so that you can make sure that the books are within that 50% level, even though it's not the most comfortable environment for you. So those are really the major elements, but I also wanted to touch on smoke and dust, because those are also things that impact everyone. Now, if you are a smoker and you smoke within your house, just keep in mind that the paper in your collection, if, if the smoke is going into your library, uh, that paper will absorb it and it can take on that smoke odor. And it might not be a problem for you and that's absolutely fine, but just keep in mind that if you ever plan on selling some of your books, some of your collection, you're gonna want to let people know that they do come from a smoked environment because that smell has permeated the pages. And for a lot of people it can be an issue for allergies or various other reasons uh, and it will hamper their ability to enjoy the books or whatever it is that you have in your home. If you are not a smoker and you do happen to buy something that has a smoke odor, I do have a way that you can actually fix that issue. And I made a quick video about it months ago, uh, but that is by using dryer sheets because dryer sheets actually help to absorb odor. And what I've done in the past is I've taken, I bought a bunch of books off of someone that I had no idea that they had that smoky smell with them, but it was impossible to read them. Um, I opened the books and it just was like getting smacked in the face by you know someone blowing cigarette smoke directly into my space because I don't smoke so I'm a lot more sensitive to it. Uh, someone who smokes might not matter to them at all. But what I did was put a bunch of dryer sheets in between the pages of my book and I left the books with the dryer sheets between the pages in a trash bag. I sealed it, let all the air out, sealed it up, uh, and then I double bagged it, did another bag with letting all the air out of that one as well. And over time, I went back to it about a few days later, checked, and I could tell that the smell was going away. It wasn't completely gone, so I tied it back up, left it for a few more days, and I wanna say after seven to 10 days, I came back, opened the bag, 
and the smell was completely gone. Now the dryer sheets also don't leave any residue, and if you want, you can use dryer sheets that have odor or don't have an odor, but it really doesn't absorb the odor of the dryer sheets, that doesn't stick with them. I had like fresh scent dryer sheets, but the books that I did this with do not smell like laundry at all. It does not leave a residue, so you don't have to worry about that. And dryer sheets are not that expensive either, so it is an option that's pretty good if, if you want to get rid of the smell, but you have a little bit of a budget. I know you can buy some of them at like uh, Dollar Tree or something like that, uh, that will work just well. And the last part, of course, we'll talk about dust. Now, whether you collect stuff or not, dust is in everyone's home. Uh, you want to make sure that for your own health, because dust can be an allergen, it can affect your breathing, you want to make sure that you, you create an environment that uh, is healthy for you. Um, and one of the best things to do with that is make sure that you're changing your air filters in your home whenever they need to be changed. Some air filters only last for a month, some for two months or three months. We have ones that last for six months. And so whenever it's time to change those filters out, we go up there, pull the filter out, put a new one in there, uh, and then we're good for another six months. Make sure that you're changing it on time, otherwise the filter is not able to, to filter out all the crud that's in your air and that stuff just circulates throughout your home. Uh, secondly, make sure that you're dusting your ceiling fans, not just in your library, but this is just a general tip for everyone because I often would forget to dust my ceiling fan and then after not dusting it for months, you turn the fan on and all of a sudden the dust just rains down like it's snowfall and it gets on everything and it's it's gross and it's dusty and, and it's it's not fun. So make sure you're dusting the ceiling fan blades so that that doesn't happen to you once you turn your ceiling fan on. Now of course also dust your library. Dust in front of your books on the shelves, dust the tops of your books. You know you can you know, dust everything on top, the spines of your books in front of the shelves. If you have space on the front of the shelves for your books and stuff, you don't have to pull the books off the shelves every single time you dust. That's not necessary. Um, just if you're moving your collection around, uh, you can dust beneath them, but usually there's not a ton of dust buildup underneath. Just make sure that you're wiping the dust with a cloth, a, you know, or a feather duster to get everything off. Uh, and do that as much as you see that it is needed. In some situations, some people might not need to dust so much. Some people might need to dust every few days. For me, it's usually once a week or once every other week, and that works perfect for me in getting rid of all of the, uh, the dust in my library. So now I've gone over the five major elements that really cause damage to people's books and talked about how to maintain an environment that's positive for your library and also positive for your personal health, because that of course is very important as well. As collectors, everyone knows nothing's gonna last forever, but as long as we do have the things that are in our collection, you wanna make sure that they stay in best shape that they can and are usable, readable, whatever, for as long as they could possibly be. So, I hope that all of this advice is helpful. I hope that maybe you took something from this video that you may have not already known and can use this information for yourself for the future. I hope that basically this was informative, but I also hope it was pretty entertaining as well to watch me talk about these things for as long as I have been. Now, I'm not an expert on any of these subjects, so I know there's probably information that I didn't give here. There's probably some elements that I didn't talk about that can, uh, that can cause damage to your books, but I just wanted to talk about the main five that I have specific knowledge about and that I have experience with. So again, hopefully this was helpful and hopefully it was also entertaining. Thank you so much for spending the time with me. If you like this video, please go ahead and subscribe to my channel, press the like button, and hit the bell when you subscribe so that you're notified of all the upcoming videos that I publish every single week. With that, again, thank you for spending time with me and I'll see you all on the next one. Peace out.